that in my career I've actually built or done some work in associations that has been dramatic. Let me give you one example and you'll understand why. Five years, uh, about four and a half years ago, on a teleconference call, we, a group of us in New York State got together and decided that there was going to be a New York State chapter of NSA, the National Speakers Association. I did not want to participate. I did not want to help. That was not my uh, reason for being on the phone. We didn't have the Long Island chapter and the New York chapter, New York City chapter. They were separate. This was the upstate area. And lo and behold, I was nominated as the president of the National Speakers Association of New York State. And when I take on a challenge, I always take on that challenge to the, to the best that I can. And in the first month, I came up with some strategies, and we started growing. I won't fill you in the details on it, but just uh, two days ago, we received an email that came in. It said, good morning, David. Just to let you know that the board of directors of the Kentucky chapter unanimous, unanimously voted yes to join the New York State chapter, the entire chapter. Our dues will be the last, uh, in on the last of July, and we have a full count of our current members and candidates. Our administration director, Diane, will be in touch with you, and she can tell you what to do, you can tell her what to do next. We expect to sign up approximately 50 new members to New York State. We are right now at a count of 800 subscribers. We're the largest chapter in the United States. The next nearest chapter is 225 in Arizona. We're the largest chapter in the world and the fastest growing. As a matter of fact, we have 34 people in Australia, three in China, two in Nigeria, and any given week with absolutely no marketing, we get between two to 10 new subscribers signing up around the world. And we are the New York State chapter. So because of these type of things that I've done over my history, New York State uh, ASAE group asked me to come in and present. I gave a presentation, they, they loved it, they, uh, Peggy sent out an email to everybody, Penny sent out an email to everybody in the United States, asked David to come in. So from that, I've given several of these ASAE programs, or SAE programs, and that's the reason I'm here today, to show you, in essence, what I do to grow an association. Now here's a few things that I'd like you to consider. Some rules of engagement, if you want to call. First, you don't have to accept every idea I give you. That's okay. I'm not here to be loved. I'm not here to be liked. I'm going to give you what I've done and I've seen that's been successful. The second thing is, I, I'm assuming you're already doing a great job. I'm not up here to say you're broken and that I can fix you. That's not my prerogative. As a matter of fact, I was reading some of the statistics. 47,610 meetings in 06. 3.5 million people visiting Florida. 6 million room nights and 70% of your events are under 77 people. I mean, you're obviously doing a great job. But when I listen to the challenges, and I've interviewed several members of the audience, I've got a list of about 10 single-spaced pages of notes, they came up with the same challenges. The economy is an issue. How are you gonna grow your association? Getting the younger generation involved, that's a challenge. Uh, fundraising, recruitment, retention, board issues, it's all very consistent. So what I've addressed, I believe I can help you in addressing in the same vein. Uh, number three is mental work is tough. You know, we talk about the people who work outside every day and they come home and they're tired. But you could sit at a desk for two hours or in a meeting for two hours, walk out and be spent. I'm hoping to challenge you. And if you sit there and you're tired and you're saying, this doesn't make any sense, I don't know how it fits in, that's a good thing. That's a sign that I'm actually breaking through to new paradigms that'll help you to do your job better. Number four, don't take anything personally. I do not know you personally. If you have a problem with anything I've said or you feel I'm talking about you, you might want to get that checked out. <laughs> and number, four, number five, each idea I offer can give you value. So if you don't like one and you like another, that's okay with me. So let me give you one tip of the day. I'm actually doing two programs today. I'm going to go uh, due to time to 9.55 and then I'm gonna stop right there. And then I'm gonna continue this presentation in the next session, uh, I think it's one or 1.30 or whatever, it's in the afternoon. So I'm going to go as far as we can to, at this point and then I'm going to go to the next session. So here's the tip of the day to carry through it is I want you to think of a member. 
I want you to think of one of your members. Now, there's a lot of there are a lot of vendors here. Think of a customer. I want to, will you put them in your mind? I want you to think about what they do at work, what their desk looks like. I want you to think about the organization they're involved with, the challenges they have. I even now want you to think about their home life. I want you to think about, are they going through a divorce? Are they very happy? Do they have 44 children? Whatever the challenges that they're facing, and I want you to, for a minute, not to say thinking of the member or we put on the member's hats. I want you to be a member. I want you to be a member throughout this. Now, I want you to pick a second one that's a complete opposite of that person. We often have the belief that we know how to put on someone else's hats, but we don't. We assume we're putting on the hats. I want you to think about what they're going through. The average person does not have association on their mind. It's not their life. You are a part of it. So by thinking in this new vein, you'll be able to get more value for what I'm going to deliver. Here's a quick little test we're going to do, or a little self-assessment. And then we'll go on to two concepts and the 10 uh, ways in which you can rapidly grow an association. What I'd like you to do is look at this little chart here. It's not too complicated. And I want you to look at your particular organization. If you have activity of members and it's low and the growth is low, you basically have inactive members. Where do you sit on this? For example, if you have high activity and low growth, you, have, uh, you, you actually have active members, but you're real, they're not really doing much. They're not growing in that organization. They're not renewing. Let's go to the top one. This is where everybody wants to be. We want to shoot there. How do you get active members and at the same time get high growth? That's where you want to be pointing. Now, active and high growth is a challenge in associations. Typically, there's a group of you know, 30, 40, 60 members who are very, very active. The board of directors is made up of some people who, who, who kind of like crutch in after 75 years of being on the committee, and they're trying to help grow this organization. But everybody on the phone that I spoke to said, one of the challenges is to get other people active. So I've got to believe you've got those same challenges also. So I want you to be thinking about how, as a, an individual, if you're thinking of the tip of the day, how do you get that person active? How do you draw them away from what they do so that they're going to participate in, in your functions, whether they're just going to functions or they're actually involved in a higher level? So we're going to go to, we've got our squirrel. Let me give you two tips or two philosophies. One, I believe that everybody loves change. I know there's a saying people don't love change. I think people absolutely love change. I'd like you to consider for a moment. You like new cars? New homes? Going on vacation? The birth of a child? All of those are experiences which you love. When I was growing up, I, I love remote controls because I was for my father the remote control. Many, many of you don't know the day. I'm looking at the audience. I used to sit next to the television and we had three channels. And I would turn the channel whenever he needed it turned, and then I would hit the TV whenever it scrolled, and then my father was brilliant. He realized if I hold the antenna during the show, it doesn't flip and everything works. That was my seat. He had a wireless remote, by the way. He could talk to me. I believe we love change. I think what we don't love is two things about change. One, change that impacts us negatively and change that's unexpected. My son, about a year and a half ago, was running through a gym, tripped up his feet with another person, hit the wall, and fell on the floor. And somewhere in between there, he broke his arm in half. That's negative and unexpected. It, at work or in business, we have a lot of negative and unexpected change. The manager or the CEO or somebody walks up and says, I got a project for you. I'd like you to do this. It's going to require a lot of work. And I need it done in about three weeks. And you, you look at them and you're thinking, any more money? And they're saying, no, 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 this is part of your job responsibility.